This is Michael Kern Hayes from Kepner Trigo. I am a senior principal in the company. I've been with the company for 25 years. Uh, I basically work in highly regulated industries, primarily life science, food and beverage, and some of the banking clients that we have. I spend my time doing root cause analysis in the manufacturing environments in those areas, as well as the IT space in those areas. Uh, my colleague presenting today is John Ager. He will be doing the majority of the talking. Uh, I'll be the guy uh, driving the slides. And uh, John, why don't you talk a little bit about yourself? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Ager. I've been with Kepner Shigo 28 years. Most of my work has been in regulated industries, as with Michael, uh, doing root cause analysis facilitations, leading decisions, and supporting project management. Shall we begin? For those of you not familiar with Dr. Deming, he passed away in 1993. His legacy lives on in the Deming cycle, Plan, Do, Study, Act and also in the Deming Prize, Japan's annual quality award. This award was named in honor of his work introducing statistical process control to Japan and his contribution to the Japanese post-war economic miracle of 1950 to 1960. In addition, his ideas were fundamental to the development of the Toyota production system. With respect to this quote, fortunately, Charles Kepner and Benjamin Trigo, based on observations and interviews, codified and documented the four critical thinking processes highly effective leaders follow and the questions they ask, gather, sort, organize, and analyze information when problem solving and decision making. In 1960, they began offering workshops to transfer these skills to others, and in 1965, they published their findings in The Rational Manager. Critical thinking begins with the recognition we need information to take effective action either to fix a problem when performance has changed, or to make a choice when expectations have changed, or to make sure an action or plan works when performance or expectations could change, or to understand unclear issues when we don't know what is the change. 8D is an application model based on these critical thinking processes developed by Ford to address product defects, which, in addition to applying root cause analysis principles to find cause, begins with framing the problem and ends with making choices about corrective actions, preventive actions, and managing any risks associated with implementing those corrective actions, preventive actions. To understand unclear issues, that is, understand what the change or problem is and plan resolution, highly effective leaders apply the logic of situation appraisal to answer the question, what do we need to know? AD applies this uh, logic of situation appraisal to define or frame the deviation and assemble a team. To fix a problem when performance has changed and they need to know cause to take effective action, highly effective leaders apply the logic of problem analysis to answer the question, what did change? In AD, the logic of problem analysis is first applied to describe the problem and understand what containment actions are needed. Once the problem is contained, the logic of problem analysis is then again applied to identify and verify root cause. To make a choice when expectations have changed and they need to choose how to meet the new expectations, highly effective leaders apply the logic of decision analysis and answer the question, what should change? In 8D, this logic is applied to select and verify corrective actions. To make sure an action or plan works when performance or expectations could change, Highly effective leaders apply the logic of potential problem or opportunity analysis to answer the question, what could change? In 8D, the logic of potential problem analysis is applied to implement corrective actions and prevent recurrence. Finally, the logic of potential opportunity analysis is applied to consider opportunities for continuous improvement, and the logic of the performance system is applied to recognize team performance. Although investigations ultimately require the application of all the critical thinking to effectively implement countermeasures, the focus of this webinar will be on applying the logic of problem analysis to support the root cause analysis portion. First, to describe the problem, then identify, and finally verify root cause and the different tools that can be incorporated to support those efforts. There are many tools that can be used to support root cause analysis. Some of the more popular ones are listed on the vertical axis. And to apply them appropriately, 
it is important to consider their intent, how the information they provide supports the fundamental underlying root cause analysis process listed on the horizontal axis. We apply root cause analysis when we've had a change in performance. Someone or something is no longer performing as it should. We don't know cause, and we need to know cause to take effective action. Three points here. First, for a particular problem, there can only be one true cause, perhaps a multivariable cause, but one explanation. Second, because there is a correct answer, it is important to begin an investigation by gathering relevant facts to reduce the number of irrelevant variables considered and provide a means for CYA. Check your assumptions. Third, investigations are most effective when focused on explaining one cause and effect relationship at a time. So the first step in a root cause analysis is to frame the problem to be solved. What is the object with the deviation, and what deviation does it have? The five whys and cause maps fault tree analysis can be used to ensure we begin with an appropriate problem statement and frame the cause and effect relationship we are looking to explain. Highly effective leaders use this problem statement to guide gathering is, is not facts that further frame the problem and establish its boundaries. They then use the is and is not facts to look for distinctions specific to the is facts to increase their understanding of the problem and help them identify relevant variables or changes that affect only the is. With these facts in place, we can begin considering hypotheses about cause. The logic of failure modes and effects analysis, or potential problem analysis, guides us to consider multiple possible causes. The logic of fishbone Ishikawa diagrams guides us to consider different categories of causal factors. The logic of cause maps fault tree analysis guides us to consider interactions and combinations of causal factors. Once we've identified possible causes, we need to evaluate how well they explain the facts, the is and is not pairs, and identify any gaps in our knowledge about how the possible cause created the presenting problem. The causes which can explain the facts with fewest and most reasonable assumptions are our most probable causes. Whatever assumptions are required for the most probable cause to be true become the basis for developing a confirmation plan to gather any additional facts needed to confirm true cause. As mentioned before, the 8D methodology incorporates all of these principles, and later we will discuss how A3 provides a framework for presenting findings. Hey, John, before you advance to that polling slide, there's a question that came up. Um, real quick, what differentiates the KT approach from the 8D approach? The 8D approach is a collection of the fundamental tools codified by Inkepter Trigo. So from my ex uh, experience, there's not much difference between the two. OK. Um, as we go along, folks, please make sure you ask questions. Uh, we'll be happy to try to answer some during the presentation and get to the rest of them when we finish. All right, John, get us to that polling question. All right. Let's see. I believe it's up there now. Um, the polling questions are, what two root cause analysis tools do you use the most? The first one is five whys. The second one is fishbone. The third one is known as KT, and it's is, is, nots. Fourth one is fault tree. The fifth one is cause mapping. Uh, and the sixth one is if you have other tools or tools um, that you use, please type those in the chat box and uh, we'll collect those and get some answers to some of those as we move forward. Again, take your top two that you use. Please click them off. We'll take about 20 seconds to do this poll. Um, John, in our world, uh, I think we see all of those, all five of those used quite extensively by our client base. It'll be really curious to see how the poll turns out. Again, please get two of them up there. I'll give you about another 10 seconds or so, and we'll go in and see what the results are. Well, it looks like five Ys, which is something I would expect, is used 77% of the time by people, 46% um, for fish bones, 20% for the KT world, fault tree is 10, uh, cause mapping is 23, that's awesome. And we've got some others in there around 6%. Uh, that's, that's not unusual, John, what do you think? Um, those are 
uh, popular tools, and when applied appropriately, they can help you advance your investigations. <laughs> Moving along. So let's begin with discussing the application of the five whys to answer the question, what is the problem? The five whys, a product of the Toyota production system, is more of a philosophy than a problem-solving tool. Root cause of any problem is ultimately a less than perfect decision or decisions. People made choices that permitted the conditions required for the problem to exist. Whether apocryphal or true, this popular example illustrates the intent and mechanics behind using the five whys to get to root cause. Beginning with chunks of cement falling from the Jefferson Memorial, the causal chain leads us to an earlier decision to turn the lights on before dusk, which attracted midges, attracted spiders, attracted birds, which did what birds do and resulted in frequent cleaning of the Jefferson Memorial. So the five whys begins with a presenting problem, the problem statement. And we ask, why did this happen? If we know why, we document the answer. If not, we conduct an investigation to determine cause and begin again until we reach the decision or decisions that started the causal chain. Two points here. First, the philosophy of the five whys lies at the core of root cause analysis. We need to continue investigating until we get past mechanical causes and address the systemic and procedural causes that contributed to the decisions which started the causal chain. The implication of this is multiple iterations of root cause analysis may be re uh, required to get to true cause. Second, the answers to the why questions need to be specific, object deviation format, and factual to both allow for taking effective corrective actions, preventive actions, and to provide a starting point for each subsequent investigation. Investigations must begin with facts. A derivative of the five whys is the cause map, also referred to as cause and effect diagrams or incident maps. This is a useful tool for documenting and communicating findings to allow for further analysis and presenting recommendations when we need to consider the interactions of multiple mechanical, procedural, and systemic contributing factors, often including multiple decisions. Again, we start with a problem statement and ask, why did this happen? The difference from the traditional use of the five whys is when multiple causes working in concert are required to cause the problem. We will then have multiple parallel causal chains. Each of the parallel causal chains may require separate investigations and ultimately separate countermeasures. Footnote. Cause maps can be used to diagram either the past for root cause analysis when answering the question, what did change, or the future for fault tree analysis when answering the question, what could change. We will discuss this more later. Once root cause analysis has moved beyond mechanical causes and requires an understanding of the procedural and systemic factors that contributed to the less than perfect decision or decisions that began the causal chain, it is helpful to use a performance system model to systematically consider which systemic and procedural factors contributed to the decisions in question. When solving mechanical problems, it is not unreasonable to expect identical products to be identical. When solving performance problems, it is helpful to recognize people or individuals and their differences need to be considered when explaining their decisions and implementing solutions. Similar to investigating mechanical deviations, when investigating performance deviations, performance system analysis begins with framing the specific response in question. It is important when documenting the response that it be factual, observable, and measurable. What specifically was done or not done? Beginning with labels like not accountable or careless or inattentive will be counterproductive and lead to ineffective countermeasures, like retraining. Once the response has been framed, we need to consider the situation. Are the expectations, signals to perform, and inputs for the desired response sufficient? Also, what is the priority for the desired response relative to other responsibilities? Performer, are they capable of the desired response? Are the consequences for the desired response sufficiently encouraging relative to the consequences for other responsibilities? Finally. Is there a feedback loop to guide and support the performers in achieving the desired response? We will revisit this again towards the end of the presentation, but first we have another poll. 
Okay, John, thanks a lot. Uh, this poll is around performance system. The model John presented to you is just one aspect of many that are out there. But when you look at performance system, which is human performance here, um, what do you use most frequently to consider as part of your root cause analysis investigations? The situation, which is the expectations, how clear or well are they understood by the person performing this? The situation, which is the signal to perform, how easy is it to recognize when they're supposed to do the task or the task is actually happening? Um, the situation, the inputs, tools, information, processes that support the work, the priorities around how their responsibilities are prioritized, the performer's capability, uh, and then the last one there, uh, consequences, what's in it for me from the perspective of the performer, the feedback, how do they know they're performing, and any other aspect that you use for human performance. Take about uh, 20 seconds or so, click on one of them, which you use in your investigations for root cause analysis. John, what's that what's in it for me mean? Well, all of us are motivated by different things. And um, so what is it that gets us out of bed in the morning and, and why do we go to work? And in some cases, the, the workplace uh, puts up task interference that makes it difficult to do a good job. Uh, in other cases, the, the workplace removes those barriers to performance and, and people tend to be much more productive under those circumstances. Great. All right. Let's take a look at what the poll results are. All right, so 48% people talk about the situation. How clear is it? How understood are they? 16, 17%, um, the signals perform. When do I start the task? When do I stop? 63%, that's a big one. Uh, inputs, what tools, information, processes, and support the work? Then we start going down 22% on the priorities, 35% on the capability, 12% on the consequences, 26% on the feedback, uh, and a very small number on that. John, what do you think about, scroll back up a little bit, what do you think about that answer around the uh, people's capabilities? Well, capabilities are interesting in, in a lot of cases. Um, if, if the person's not capable, um, why are they doing the job and, and is it reasonable to have expectation for them? Um, that being said, that's an important component to consider when you're changing someone's job responsibility setting. You need to consider how to upskill them to, to make them be productive. Okay, we're off to the next slides, John. Very good. Now that we've explored root cause, applying root cause analysis tools for framing problems, let's move on to consider the application of root cause analysis tools to describe the problem, identify, and verify root cause. With Jack Swigert's trans, uh, transmission... Whoa, John, this is Apollo 13? Yes. What's the guy's name, Jack Swigert? Correct. Wait a minute, it's Tom Hanks. Well, that's... Come on. Was, yes, well... For, for my generation, it was Tom Hanks. Very good. <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, depending upon your point of reference with either Jack Swigert's or Tom Hanks' transmission... Uh, began an 87-hour epic to return Apollo 13 safely to Earth. NASA's handling of the Apollo 13 mission is an excellent example of applying critical thinking to resolve a crisis under time pressure. In the case of Apollo 13, NASA had not one but three problems to solve to successfully bring the astronauts back to Earth after a catastrophic failure while in lunar orbit. Or you could say they had three critical questions they needed to answer. What did change to cause a loss of oxygen and power? What should change to restore oxygen and power and bring the astronauts safely home? What could change on the way home that would jeopardize or enhance their safe arrival? Fortunately, many of the engineers who were on duty at different times during the crisis had participated in critical thinking workshops provided by Kepner Trigo, and they were supported by Kepner Trigo consultants who spent many hours speaking on the telephone with the engineers from the three different mission control centers, helping to stabilize the processing of information with the engineers and preventing the jumping to conclusions temptation. Here is the 8D methodology annotated with the critical questions NASA needed to answer. Initially, they were not sure what had happened and began gathering data about the condition of the various systems to understand what the problem was and was not 
and what could have caused it so they could stabilize the situation before considering how to recover the mission. This cause map illustrates NASA's findings after they used an expedited form of problem analysis to establish that a catastrophic failure of service module oxygen tank number two was the cause of the loss of power and oxygen, which made impossible completing the original mission. At that point in time, they did not need to know the cause of the catastrophic failure to make the decisions and manage the risks necessary to return the astronauts safely to Earth. Those decisions and risks included managing the use of critical consumables, water to cool the command service module and lunar module, battery power, the command service module batteries for use during reentry, and the lunar module batteries for the rest of the mission, lunar module oxygen for breathing, and lithium hydroxide filter canisters to remove carbon dioxide from the spacecraft cabin atmosphere. Once the astronauts were returned, NASA established a review board to conduct another root cause analysis to determine the cause of the catastrophic failure of oxygen tank number two. Again, Kepner Trigo consultants provided support to help NASA get to the root cause, which caused the explosion in the first place, so as to prevent another occurrence. One of Kepner and Trigo's observations when codifying the critical thinking highly effective leaders apply when searching for root cause is that they use comparative analysis to narrow and focus their consideration of variables. As there can only be one true cause for a particular problem, the less variables we have to consider, the more efficient we will be. NASA began by comparing failed oxygen tank number two to similar tanks to help them isolate distinctions and changes unique to oxygen tank number two. It is critical when conducting comparative analysis to find comparisons as closely related to the affected object as possible. When looking for a needle in a haystack, the smaller the haystack, the better. It is also ultimately more efficient if we initially analyze thin slices of data before aggregating all the information into a single solution. So in addition to comparing the object with the deviation to similar objects, Highly effective leaders also consider where the problem is and is not observed to assess if there are geographic variables to consider, and when the problem is and is not observed to assess if there are timing variables to consider. Here is some of the relevant data from Apollo 13 presented in an abbreviated is and is not framework. In addition to the deviation occurring in oxygen tank number two rather than oxygen tank number one, the failure could have been observed at Kennedy Space Center during the countdown demonstration test but was not. Also, the failure could have been observed earlier in the mission, but was not. All of these data points can initially be considered when identifying possible causes and must be considered later when evaluating and confirming true causes. With the problem description or problem specification completed, we can move to identify possible causes. Broadly speaking, there are two approaches to identifying causal factors either using knowledge and experience from past events, or, when this is not sufficient, comparing the is and is not pairs to guide the search for distinctions and changes specific to the is facts. Theoretically, unless we have a lot of experience from solving similar problems over and over again, as do automobile mechanics and help desk technicians, our knowledge and experience about a particular cause might be limited. Two tools, fishbone diagrams or Ishikawa diagrams and cause maps or fault tree analysis, can be employed to enhance both the use of knowledge and experience and distinction. Hey, John. Uh, there's a good question here, as you mentioned, fishbone analysis, fault tree analysis. And the question is around the uh, five whys and fault tree. Can you explain quickly a little bit of difference between those two? Uh, the, the fault tree analysis is an extension of the logic of the five whys, like with a cause map. Uh, in a fault tree, you have multiple causal chains. In the five whys, you traditionally have a single chain. And as I said before, to my mind, the five whys is more of a philosophy than a tool. So the fault tree, the fishbone, uh, are a way of collecting um, lots of different data points when we want to consider multiple factors. Thank you. All right. So when relying on knowledge and experience, the logic of fishbone diagrams encourages us to consider multiple categories of causal factors. Fishbone diagrams begin with the presenting problem documented as a problem statement in the head of the fish, and then possible causes are documented on the spines. In a manufacturing setting, people often consider the six M's, manpower or people, 
machine, material, method, measures, and Mother Nature or the environment. In a service setting, they often consider the four Ps, policies or high-level decision rules, procedures or specific tasks, people, and plant or technology. As we discussed before, to appropriately apply tools, it is important to understand their intent and how they support the fundamental underlying process. In the final analysis, our goal is to implement corrective and preventive actions that address the specific true cause or specific combination of true causes. So there are three cautions when uh, documenting possible causes. First, as we discussed in relation to the five whys, the causes need to be specific. Generalized causes become moving targets which are difficult to prove or disprove and can lead to the implementation of global solutions for local problems with unintended consequences. Second, although predefined generic causal categories, or in fact, predefined generic causes, may give the appearance of streamlining the root cause analysis process and make trending easier, they are of little value if they do not lead us to the specific true cause or result in generic corrective and preventive actions. Third, it is more efficient to focus on identifying and proving primary possible causes before taking time to speculate on secondary or tertiary possible causes. This effort may not be value added if the primary possible causes prove false. This is one portion of the cause map fault tree analysis NASA used to document all possible combinations and interactions of all possible causal factors and whether these factors were individually sufficient to cause the problem or must have acted in concert with other factors to cause the problem. Cause maps fault trees begin in the same way as the fishbone Ishikawa with the presenting problem documented as a problem statement either at the top of the chart or to one side. From this begins an examination of the system, process, and inputs that produces the object in question to identify possible causes for the deviation. These are documented either as acting independently or logic or as acting in concert with other causes and logic. As with Fishbone and Shikawa diagrams, when using cause maps fault tree analysis, it is important to document specific causes in object deviation format rather than general categories of cause so we can prove or disprove them and, when appropriate, implement specific corrective actions, preventive actions. This is the full fault tree analysis documented by NASA. It consists of 26 pages. In the case of Apollo 13, NASA used the fault tree both reactively to understand the catastrophe, answering the question what did change, and proactively to prepare for the next mission, answering the question what could change. When being used proactively to manage risk, identifying all possible combinations and interactions of all possible causal factors makes sense so the risk of each can be assessed and appropriately managed. When being used reactively to find true cause and implement kappas, as with Fishbone and Shikawa diagrams, it may not be value added to deeply pursue secondary and tertiary possible causes until primary possible causes have been proven. Because we are searching for one true cause, when their knowledge and experience is limited, or when their knowledge and experience produces too many causal factors, highly effective leaders use the concept of distinctions and changes to focus on causal factors that only affect the is facts when compared to the is not facts. The logic of both Fishbone and Shikawa diagrams and cause maps fault tree analysis can be helpful in prompting our thinking when looking for distinctions and changes. In the case of Apollo 13, a significant distinction was the use of a 65 volt heater to detank oxygen tank number two after the countdown demonstration test. Oxygen tank number one was detanked following no more protocols. Subsequent testing suggested the temperature within oxygen tank number two had probably reached 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit against a standard of 80 degrees Fahrenheit, a significant change. This likely created conditions that resulted in an electric arc that ignited materials inside the tank when electric fans were used in space to stir the tank's contents. Once we've identified possible causes, either using Fishbone and Shikawa diagrams or cause maps fault tree analysis, organize our knowledge and experience or guide looking for distinctions and changes, we need to evaluate those possible causes to assess in what order they should be investigated further. Although some practitioners advocate voting, because root cause analysis requires a correct answer rather than a popular answer, 
Highly effective leaders use the is and is not facts to focus their efforts on the causes that best explain those facts and make the most sense. To be true, a cause must explain all of the is and is not pairs. The cause that best explains the is and is not pairs becomes our most probable cause, and any assumptions necessary for the cause to be true become the basis for developing our confirmation plan. Here are NASA's findings about three possible causes. The investigators used the facts they had gathered about the accident to rule out two causes, the tank heaters and the quantity probe, and focus on an electric arc as the most probable cause. Our evaluation of the possible causes should highlight where we have sufficient facts about the cause to explain how it created the problem and where there are gaps in our knowledge or assumptions necessary for the cause to be true. Those gaps in our knowledge become the basis of our plan to confirm true cause. In some cases, it may be possible to verify the assumptions simply by reviewing data. Or, if the problem is recurring, we can use the information we have gathered about timing to try and observe it happening. Another approach is to conduct experiments designed, using the data we have collected, to recreate the problem in a safe setting. Finally, we would implement corrective and preventive actions and set effectiveness checks to validate conclusions. These are NASA's findings from the tests they conducted to conclude that heating oxygen tank number two for eight hours to 1,000 degrees against a standard of 80 degrees could create the conditions that allowed an electric arc to start combustion inside the tank after multiple uses of the tank stirring fan. This diagram shows the individual steps within problem analysis and the relationship of the five whys Fishbone and Ishikawa diagrams, and cause maps, fault tree analysis. Once we have confirmed cause of the presenting problem, we again apply the logic of the five whys to assess the need for further investigation. In the case of Apollo 13, we have discussed two iterations of root cause analysis. First, to determine cause of the loss of power and oxygen. The second, to determine the cause of the oxygen tank number two failure. Next, the NASA investigators needed to determine how it was oxygen tank number two was heated to 1,000 degrees. Hey, John, there's a couple questions around five whys, and I hear this quite often. Um, they typically talk about when you do five whys, that's just the number that's out there. It's five. And the question is, you know, how do you know when you've reached the root cause? How do you know if you've asked enough whys? How many times are there too many whys? Do you have any comments about that? Well, the... The thing that I'm looking for is have we gotten to systems and procedures? And so whatever the behavior in question is, um, how is it that that, that behavior is, um, or how, how is it that that deviation is allowed to exist? And so um, someone made a choice of a particular material to use. If they chose the wrong material, why did they choose the wrong material? So until we get to the, the choices that people make, and the systems and procedures that guide those choices, uh, we are at risk of similar problems occurring again. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So, um, as I said before, in this diagram, uh, once you get to root cause, you have to ask yourself, um, is, the, is the cause of the presenting deviation another deviation? And do we need to know cause of that deviation to take effective corrective action and prevent the problem from ever happening again? So in this case, uh, once NASA realized that the oxygen tank had been heated to 1,000 degrees, they needed to investigate why that happened and what they could do about that. So here, NASA concluded the oxygen tank reached 1,000 degrees because it was heated for over eight hours after its standard detanking procedures had not worked. And the 28 volt DC thermal switches that should have controlled for heat were welded permanently closed by the application of 65 volt DC power. When investigating why the tank was heated for over eight hours and the thermal switches were welded permanently closed, the NASA investigators uncovered a number of systemic and procedural failures that allowed this to happen. Rockwell revised the specification for the thermal switches from 28 volts DC to be compatible with 65 volts DC. But their subcontractor, Beach, who assembled the oxygen tank, did not upgrade the switches. Neither NASA 
nor Rockwell, nor Beach, detected the thermostatic switch discrepancy in their review of the documentation. Neither qualification nor acceptance testing required switch cycling under load. Switch operation was not checked during the special detanking, and officials of NASA, Rockwell, and Beach did not recognize the possibility of damage due to overheating. For those of you who would like to see more of what detail can be documented in an incident map, a cause map, here is a portion of that map. The lines show the cause and effect relationships between the different causal factors. The circle in the upper left-hand corner of each causal factor indicates the nature of the cause. The circle in the lower left-hand corner indicates the progress made for each cause. Has evidence been provided? Have solutions been proposed? Have tasks been assigned? And have notes been provided? In this map, only evidence has been documented, and that is displayed below each causal factor. Also, the causal factors are documented either as deviations in red, which need to be explained, or as desired states in yellow, which need to be managed. In the case of the oxygen tank heated to 1,000 degrees, most of the underlying contributing factors were people's choices. As we discussed earlier, to understand and consider all of the contributing systemic and procedural factors that influence the decisions people make, it is helpful to use a performance system model. We begin with the response. What specifically was done or not done? For this response, we need to consider the situation. Were the expectations, signals to perform, and inputs for the desired response sufficient? Also, what was the priority for the desired response relative to other responsibilities? Performer, were they capable of the desired response? Were the consequences for the desired response sufficiently encouraging relative to the consequences for other responsibilities? Finally, was there a feedback loop to guide and support the performers in achieving the desired response? The report of the Apollo 13 Review Board concludes with a number of recommendations, the last being that NASA thoroughly examine all of the performance systems that support the space program. John, while people are reading that NASA, the short snippet of that NASA report, there's, there's a really interesting question that's popped up that talks about the struggle at, at this person's place of employment where everyone wants to put Band-Aids on the <clears throat> symptom rather, and take care of it that way and rather than identify root cause uh, to prevent reoccurrence. <clears throat> what kind of recommendations? I know we've talked about a couple different techniques, uh, human performance technique. What kind of recommendations would you have to help that, that team and anyone else learn and understand why it's really important to get the root cause versus doing Band-Aids? Sure. So <clears throat> I'm going to go to the performance system on this one. <clears throat> so the desired response is to investigate to get to root cause. The undesired response is to put a Band-Aid. And so one question is, what are the consequences? Uh, what is it costing this organization to apply Band-Aids? How much time and effort is spent um, chasing these problems? And uh, what sort of uh, negative consequences does it have in terms of throughput, quality, and customer satisfaction? Okay, great. Continue. <clears throat> so, um, given NASA's conclusions, um, this leads us back to, to the initial question. What do we need to know to take effective action? So here we have the critical thinking questions NASA needed to answer during the next iteration of critical thinking. They would need to apply the logic of situation appraisal to plan for resolution. They would need to apply the logic of problem analysis to find cause. They would need to apply the logic of decision analysis to choose corrective and preventive actions. They would need to apply the logic of potential problem opportunity analysis to implement the corrective actions and We began by reflecting on Dr. Deming's admonition that critical thinking requires a structured approach to gather, sort, organize, and analyze information when problem solving and decision. We have discussed how the processes codified and documented by Kepner and Trigo provide the foundation for the 8D methodology and were used by NASA to resolve the Apollo 13 incident. We have discussed in some detail how problem analysis provides the foundation for root cause analysis and some tools that can be used to enhance its application. Although we did not discuss in detail the use of decision analysis or potential problem or opportunity analysis, NASA applied these as well and also 
They provide the foundation for the effective application of Six Sigma Demaic and the lean methodologies. As, as with choosing which tools to apply to support root cause analysis, when choosing which methodologies to apply to resolve a particular situation, it is important to consider their intent and how the information they provide supports taking effective action. One consideration is whether your problem is the result of special cause variation, for which there is one correct answer, or common cause variation, for which there might be a range of factors to consider addressing. 8D is most effectively applied when the problem is a change in performance, special cause variation, and the need is to determine what factors did change to cause the change in performance so we can implement corrective actions, preventive actions to restore the underlying process so it is stable and in control. Six Sigma Demaic is a method for continuous improvement, most effectively applied when the problem is a change in expectations and we need to choose which factors should change to meet the new expectations. It was developed by Motorola to reduce common cause variation within a stable and in control process, that is already at three sigma, to better meet customer needs. While 8D begins by applying the logic of situation appraisal to frame the problem to be solved, the MAIC begins by applying the logic of situation appraisal to define customer needs and measure the capability of the process designed to meet that need. Once gaps and opportunities in the process have been prioritized, MAIC applies the logic of decision analysis to analyze and choose how to redesign or change the process to meet the new expectations. After the choice has been made, the MAIC applies the logic of potential problem analysis to improve by supporting the implementation of that choice and the logic of potential opportunity analysis in the performance system to control and sustain improvements. Lean is similar to Demaic. It was developed as part of the Toyota production system to address the seven forms of waste. Most of the lean tools are focused on identifying waste, which, similar to define and measure in Demaic, involves applying the logic of situation appraisal. Once the waste is identified, the principles of analyze, improve, and control can be applied when taking action to reduce the waste found. Finally, A3 is a methodology for documenting either root cause analysis or continuous improvement investigation. Fundamentally, A3 is a metric paper size, equivalent to 11 by 17 or ledger. A3 was introduced as part of the Toyota production system, and the philosophy behind it reflects Dr. Deming's admonition. You cannot explain your findings on a single piece of paper, you don't know what you're talking about. When applied to documenting root cause analysis, although there are some differences, the fields in most A3 templates tend to correlate with the steps in most 8D processes. Situation appraisal provides the information necessary to complete the background field. Problem analysis provides the information necessary to document the problem statement, current situation, and root cause analysis field. Decision analysis provides the information necessary to document recommendations. Potential problem analysis provides the information necessary to support effective implementation. Potential opportunity analysis provides the information necessary for effective follow-up. The final analysis, regardless of what model or methodology is applied, taking effective action requires understanding your intent and then applying the logic of the processes codified and documented by Tepner and Trigo to gather, sort, organize, and analyze the information necessary to answer the four critical questions. What do we need to know? What did change? What should change? What could change? Thank you. All right. So um, we've got about, by my clock, maybe 13 minutes to start answering some questions. But before we get to the questions, there are at least two movie buffs in this audience out there. I stand corrected. Tom Hanks played Jim Lovell. So thank you very much. I'll remember that. Uh, let's go to the questions. Uh, first one is, if there's more than one root cause, do you combine them into one root cause analysis or separate them into multiple RCAs? So the, the question here is what we need to get to a kappa. And if you believe that one corrective action, preventive action, will solve the two separate root causes, then perhaps it makes sense. But if they're going to re require 
separate corrective actions, preventive actions, trying to combine them may make the uh, root cause analysis more complicated and less effective. Okay. Um, next one, how do you distinguish between true and false data? True data are facts, false data are distractors, and that's a big one. I know when we uh, get into sites and look for our is, is not information, we're always making sure that it's actual data and not an assumption, but, but give some tips on that, John. Um, for that one, um, I don't know that Deming was the first person to say it, but Deming is credited with saying that in God we trust, all other bring data. And so uh, I think there's perhaps two questions here. Um, the first question is, is it true or is it false? And for that one, I'd be looking for supplementary information. So uh, when I was doing investigations in pharmaceutical companies, I would go pull batch records from the vault and read the batch records, or I would read through the laboratory notebooks to make sure that I was getting good, solid facts. The other aspect of that is it might be true, but it might, might not be helpful information. And that then takes us back to using the root cause analysis tools to um, only gather information that's going to advance our knowledge so that we get to true cause. All right, and there's a number of questions from what I call the power generation industry, um, electric gen people. And they, they use, uh, when they talked about root cause analysis, a number of other techniques or tools, barrier analysis, Shannon, causal facting, charting, um, a couple others. Some of those ones we haven't mentioned. What's your feeling on the more sophisticated tools uh, when you get into root cause analysis? Any idea? So uh, causal chain analysis, in my experience, is very similar to um, fault tree analysis cause mapping. Um, the Shannon techniques, um, what I know about the Shannon techniques I learned from reading Kiki Boda's book, World Class Quality. Effectively, uh, World Class Quality discusses using statistical techniques to do comparative analysis. So if you can create a large enough pool, uh, a large enough sample size, uh, you can compare the objects to identify distinctions and changes and then run experiments to determine if your theories are true or not. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, when doing Ishikawa, there are multiple potential causes and variables. Any tool or methodology or thinking to prioritize and which ones to focus on first in the fishbone? And so that's where we're, we would then apply the logic of distinctions and changes. And so for the causal factors in the fishbone to be true, they have to be true only of the is facts about the problem and not the, the is not facts about the problem. So um, that's the, one of the benefits of the is, uh, is nots provide is a filter by which we discriminate between causal factors that apply to unaffected um, objects, avoid looking at those and focus only on the causal factors that only affect the affected objects. And I know, John, here's one on SIPOC. I know you and I have had discussions around SIPOC. You just gave me a thumbs up. I'm glad this person threw it out there for you. It's, it's, a, it's a softball, I think. Let's talk, talk about SIPOC. So SIPOC is a, a fundamental tool used as, as part of um, Six Sigma Demaic. And when looking at a process, and now we're getting into the, the systems and procedures um, that generated the circumstances that allowed the, the problem to exist, um, for every process, we need to know who supplies that process, uh, what inputs are required for that process to be successful, what outputs should that process produce, and who the customers are um, for that process. So the SIPOC is a tool that can be used uh, both proactively to design processes. Uh, I've used it to proactively manage risk. Um, and effectively, the, the, most of the SIPOC elements are considered part of the performance system model. Okay. Um, going through some of these, trying to pick out some uh, ones that are common themes. What, there's some theme around AI, uh, enabled research solutions um, are discovering, and we're all into the AI space. Uh, we're driven there, which is a great thing. They're discovering insights based on the context and the information that's there. How do you see AI helping with cause and effect and root cause analysis in the future? Well, until AI is able to predict things that have not yet happened, theoretically, 
each root cause analysis should be a one-off event. If we effectively get to root cause and effectively take corrective actions, preventive actions, that problem will never happen again. And when you look at the 8D model, they talk about continuous improvement. That would include taking our learnings from a specific root cause analysis and applying it to other pieces of equipment and other systems. Um, so uh, I'm sure there will be some, some room for um, AI going forward. Um, theoretically, all the problems we solve should be new ones. Okay, here's another one around five whys, and as you call in our poll, that was the most common technique. Um, when moving down a, a whys tree and you're answering why to the previous cause, are you relating cause to the effect? For example, the oven burnt my bread. Why? Temperature was too high. Why? At this point, we've seen folks answer the question with why would temperature too high burn bread, not with why was the temperature too high? Are they both acceptable answers, or should you keep doing down five whys? What, what's happening in that? So I'm struggling to connect these dots, but um, the temperature was, was, do we know why the temperature was too high then becomes the question. So did the person set the temperature too high, or did they set the temperature and did the stove um, not perform properly? So we've, we've gotten to a, a, a why for which we don't know an answer, now we need to find cause. Um, a, another way of mapping this is now moving down the path of fault tree analysis cause maps, and the, it could have been a combination of the time in the oven and the temperature. And so um, whatever information we need to have to be able to take effective action. Okay. Um, another question from lean practitioners. Uh, insist on having a catalog and how to build defects. The thought behind that is not until you know how to build defects can you actually work on an effective measure to prevent them. What are your thoughts on that? I'm not familiar. Okay, that's, that's a fair answer. Uh, let me find another question. Let's see, what is the analytical part of five whys and fish bones? What do you see as the analytical pieces of those two techniques? Well, it depends, depends about what you mean by analytical techniques, but the five whys and the fish bones are typically used to organize the knowledge and experience we already have. Um, and it's when the five whys and the fish bones, uh, particularly the five whys, produce a why for which we don't have an answer that we turn to an investigation. Um, in terms of the fish bones, we're using it to organize theories about cause, and then the question was raised earlier, once you have populated your fish bone with a number of possible causes, how do you prioritize which of those possible causes to work on first? And that's where I said we, we need to go back, compare those possible causes back against the is not facts, see which of those causes best explain those facts. So a uh, question around software and root cause analysis tools. Um, this one's specific to fault tree or causal mapping. Are there any software tools uh, that you've used in the past that would help with causal mapping? Uh, well, uh, cause mapping is a, is a software that we use, and it was the model that I used for the uh, presentation. Okay. Um, let's see. Looking for a few more here. Uh, here's one on risk management. With risk management becoming bigger on the Internet of Things, what's the best way to apply KT to risk management? So the, the fundamental process that, that, that uh, Captain and Trigo documented for risk management is what could change. Um, we call it potential problem analysis. It has been popularized as um, failure modes and effects analysis. Um, and effectively, uh, I'm going to go back to the, to the SIPOC model. When doing risk management, uh, it's important to look at thin slices of your process or your project and focus on your customers. Um, and so many, many iterations of um, risk management may be required to completely manage the risks in either, either a project plan or in a production process. The, the logic of potential problem analysis lies behind that. 
Okay, um, we're down to about two minutes left. Um, the last question I'll put out there, and it would, would have been a poll question if I thought about it, which movie is better, Forrest Gump or Apollo 13? That just depends on who you are. Both are run by Tom Hanks. <laughs> 